Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. My name is Teresa. I'm an alcoholic. Grateful to be here. Grateful to be sober. I thought I was just going to say, no introduction necessary. All right, Teresa, come on. <laughs> I'm not sure of anybody. I just have to say this. I didn't check with Ali. I don't know if anybody was looking for Derek, but I'm sorry. <laughs> if you are, I'm upset too. He's not here. I love his um his message. Um, so it's kind of hard to fill those shoes. But here I am. Ali got excited. He was like, hear it. Oh, I'm like, nah. <laughs> it was supposed to be Ali. But anyway, um, I'm nervous. I'm uncomfortable. Um, as usual. Especially because I come to this meeting every week. This is like my other home group and I get to be of service here and listen and soak up and just be present and make sure that it goes along well. I'm also, as people know, I take care of my mom. I'm watching her on camera right before the meeting. Of course, something always happens. So I had to change her and it wasn't a simple change. I'm like, great. (laughs) But I made it right on time. (laughs) Now I'm just praying if everybody could continue in your prayers that she doesn't start yelling. Mommy's been on this yelling thing, her only way of communication, and it could be a little much. Um, so let's just hope that doesn't happen. And Kim is knocked out sleeping from her meds, so she can't be keeping her preoccupied. So it's just me, folks. <laughs> we'll see how we work this out. Um, I want to welcome anybody who's new. Please keep coming back. And anybody who's been here a while, thank you so much for just showing up, man, no matter what. I love this topic, uh, step 11, um, keeps me, uh, balanced in some way, keeps me steady. I, I thought of a pause. There's so much in there that I wanted to do. Actually, there was even quotes I wanted to get before step 11 and after step 11. Uh, ultimately I believe everything throughout this process is about building this relationship with this power. The entire 12 steps are about that, um, so I hope you listen to any similarities, not the differences, and and see if somehow, some way, what I love about our opportunity in Alcoholics Anonymous of building a relationship with a power as we understand it is that it's so personal and it gets to change. We get to learn from one another. We get to th- take certain things. I was taught when I was new, take what applies, put the rest on the shelf, and maybe bring it down later and you can use it. But I was thinking about what would I talk about? I have to pause a lot. (laughs) I'm always having to pause because what's interesting about pause when agitated, that means I must be agitated. So if I'm pausing a lot, that means I'm agitated a lot. (laughs) I just don't know what that is to just walk through life without being agitated. Um, There was so much that was going on in my mind beforehand. And I just did my prayer and asked God to just remove from me my selfishness, my self-seeking, my dishonesty, my fear, uh, and just let me be an instrument of God's love and peace. And whatever message needs to be carried, that I hear it. That's always my prayer, that the one person that needs to hear what I share tonight is me. (laughs) I don't know if anybody else is going to get it, but I better be paying attention I always learned that the best teacher is the student. And so I get to hear today what it is that I need to either validate, support, reinforce, be reminded, or begin to reiterate uh, or to just do it for the first time. And I was thinking about my relationship with alcohol. And what kept coming up for me was that at no time in my entire 57 years of living on this place called planet Earth, have I ever been in charge? Uh, I have an illness of grandiosity that tells me that I'm in control, that somehow, some way, I'm in charge of life situations. But if I really look at it, if I really, really examine my relationship with alcohol, I will see that at no time had I ever been in charge. The only thing that alcoholism did was give me the illusion that I was running something. But the insanity, we talk about insanity often around here, but the insanity of that, and what's interesting in step 10, sanity returns, right? And so I begin building this relationship in 11 because I'm now sane, but I'm sane enough to see that I had never been in charge. My reliance has always been on something. 
I have always trusted, turned to, utilized something else because as much as I thought that I was enough or unique, I never was. My reliance upon alcohol was essential for my oxygen. And if it dictated every single area of my life, when I came to you, what I understood was that I needed something else because the one higher power that I always had stopped working. And it was time to find another one. The higher power that I had turned my will and my life and my soul my dignity, my integrity, my self-respect, my self-esteem, my self-worth was dragging me through the mud. It was no longer uh, allowing me to disappear from being present for all of my experiences. And it no longer helped me to show up for life. I've never been able to show up for life since conception. You know, what's interesting is I'm born addicted, right? So that means I'm born addicted and I drank for 24 years before I came to you. So there's no way I can believe that I was ever running anything. But when I also look at similarities and I listen to other people's stories about when they found alcohol later on in life, they suffered from what I could have suffered from had mommy not given me alcohol since a baby. You know what I'm saying? Which is this terminal uniqueness, this self-centeredness. Everything about this disease is self-centeredness. This idea that the world revolves around me and not everyone in Alcoholics Anonymous, like myself, ran terror through people's lives. There's this assumption because we hear alcoholic is selfish and self-centered, self will run riot, that the only way it looks is that it is volatile and doesn't even talk about that in the big book. They gives us like four different types of alcoholics and one that there's a whole book you can write about. And so there are many voices or manifestations of the spiritual malady of alcoholism, and mine is submission. Mine is the grandiosity is an interesting dynamic of ego. My grandiosity of my alcoholism is that I'm not enough, that I am not sufficient, that I don't belong here. I don't belong here in this planet. I am unloved, unwanted, unnecessary. And it is alcohol that allowed me to show up to a life that I believe didn't want me. Everything about it told me it didn't want me. My disease is centered in my thinking. It is the narrative and the dialogue that is constantly the chatter in my head saying, you have no business being here. That's, that haunts me to this day. Those of you who knew, my sobriety date is March 29, 1990. I've been here 32 years. That means I'm 32 years sober, many more years over the time I came to you at 24, and was still the voice that is almost at a cellular level that still plays in my head is you got no business being on this planet. (laughs) None. And the higher power that I found allowed me to say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that I don't belong here. It's my puppet master, and it allows me to put on all these different costumes, these outfits, portrayals, showing up, the smile on my face. It allowed me to just show up regardless of all that was happening to say, it really doesn't matter I'm going to pretend that I'm somebody and I don't belong. And when it stopped working, I found out I don't belong and it does matter. So I needed to find this power that I saw that each of you found. Not only did it, the grace was to put the plug in the jug, but it actually began to introduce you. Well, my sponsor, my sponsor, she's passed away now, used to say, introducing me to my authentic self. That I am not my alcoholism. I have an illness, but that is not my identity. That is not who I am. I am kind, loving, considerate, gentle, mindful, have resilience, inspiration. But how do I get to my authentic self when everything in the world tells me 
that my authentic self is false. It's so interesting. I believe that my authentic self is false. Well, it seems to me that these ancient, this, and I say the big book, the words in the big book and the steps are ancient. There is nothing in that book that's original. <laughs> nothing. It is divinely inspired for a few folks to gather information that has been around for centuries and put it in a language for me to understand. But there's nothing in there that's original. How do I find the power that doesn't rob me of my dignity and my integrity and my self-respect? How do I find a power that's going to introduce me to my authentic self, that I can walk hand in hand through this thing, this uh, built up the drama of life? This dimension is intense, folks. I, I call it this dimension, man. There's a lot of dimensions. I believe there's a lot of dimensions and earth is the lowest dimension. And it's the lowest dimension because it operates. I'm going to use certain language. We could talk about it. A question I got to use. I'm just going with it. Whatever. I'm just going with it. Okay. This, this dimension operates from what we call the first chakra, the first energy, which is the tribal. Everything about this dimension is money, property, prestige, and greed. Everything about this dimension. There was a time that when you wanted to go into this place of spiritual consciousness, you needed to leave. You needed to go into a convent, into a monastery, give up all of your worldly possessions because those worldly possessions interfere with this spiritual, you know what I mean, connection. That's the only time I'm disturbed. I'm disturbed when I got to pay bills, when people are cutting me off on the freeway, when I got to deal with other people's personality and attitudes. I'm disturbed if I don't have what I think you have. Uh, if I feel physical pain, if I see people that I love being sick, that's where the disturbance comes from. But if I'm sitting in a monastery or up in the Himalayas meditating all day, I would think the only disturbance is learning how to deal with a fly that sits on my nose while I'm meditating. But other than that, there are a whole lot of disturbances. I remember I used to say, if I could just join the convent, man, I don't have to worry what happens when people who are going these spiritual quests, we go to the mountains, we go to site. Why? I separate myself from these distractions, these things that tell me they're important. Because the ego self, the self says, I got to have. What is selfishness? What do I want? I want you to love me. I want you to like me. I want to have that. I want to live there. Uh, I want to be respected. I want to be treated a certain way. I don't want to have to take care of people. Uh, I want to be able to do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it. This is the human experience. How could it not be if everything around me tells me it's necessary? Turn on the television. You got to drive that car. You got to dress like that. You got to look like that. You got to live there in order to be happy. My happiest place is in the spirit realm. Why is it the happiest place? Because it's the place of neutrality. Bill uses that language in, the, in 10 and 11. I go into a place of neutrality, a nothingness, a detachment. Buddha talks about it, total detachment. Whenever I have to come to this place of this relationship with this power through these 12 steps, what is the everything about the 12 steps having me do? Detach, let go, let go, let go. Let go, uncover, discover, discard. Be willing to uncover, discover, discard. We talk about in six. I think I'm going to be a donut, right? The hole in the donut. Who am I going to be if I let go of everything? Oh, my sponsor says my authentic self. Well, what the heck is that? What is this relationship about this power that I have, these old ideas about God in my life where I struggle in 11? And I do, I struggle because it's so interesting. I was telling a sponsee of mine how, why is it that every time I understand that I need to turn to this power greater than me, I always believe I'm not going to get what I want. What is that about? That's where the hesitation comes from. Oh, if I let go, let God, nothing's going to be in my favor. That, I'm telling you, 
everything that I desire is going to be taken away from me. That's my relationship with God. That is my understanding with God. That it will remove everything from me. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to pray and I'm going to meditate. Because what it's going to do is going to tell me that I have to let go of everything. And I don't want to let go of nothing. So I'm going to pretend like I'm not doing self will run riot. But I'm going to do it. And those end up being my darkest days. And brings me back to my knees of surrender of letting go of everything. My knee-jerk reaction isn't that when I do that, that not only am I going to get what I, no, I'm not even going to get what I want. It's going to be better. It's going to be great. I don't even think of that. I think I was talking on Lee. Well, we're always talking, but I was talking to him about, for me, God gives me a postcard and a flyer. I don't get no detailed emails. I don't get specific instructions. I don't get the the backstage information. I just get a flyer of my assignment and no details. And I spend my days, especially when stuff is really jumping off, watching the grace of God and my disease, like, uh, what do you call, what is it, King Kong and Godzilla, whatever, I don't know. I spend the day watching the two of these go at it, right? I'm, I'm the observer. I'm literally watching the disease of alcoholism and God's grace, God's beauty, the one that I've come to know, be go- they be having a, the, the, the great debate. It's this huge argument that takes place. And what's interesting about not only me observing it, I don't choose a side. I'm, I'm like, I, just, I listen to both. And so my disease comes up with something and I'm like, yep, that's right. That makes a whole lot of sense. You got a point there. And then the grace of God comes in. I'm like, see, that's, yep, trumped you. Yep, see that God takes care of me. God loves me. God don't love you. Which is when did God ever love you? People are telling God, see, that is true. Nobody has loved me. That's right. That's no, I don't even know why you say you love me. You don't love me. Yes, I do. Let me show you when I love you. These are the examples. See, these are the examples. God loves me. Those are the examples. Let me show you. I'm telling you, that's the insanity of my disease. And my prayer, I got to pray. What am I praying for? God, please remove the obsession. I call that the obsession. Remove this from me. Because I don't know about you, but that's torture. Take away my difficulties. Take away my fear. That's what I do in the pause. I pause. Because I'm watching this battle, I call it a, I don't know, I always tell people, you ever watch movies? I believe that alcoholics in AA created like DVRs and stuff like that because you can like stop it. Anyway, <laughs> no, because before DVR and, and uh, now you could download or whatever, I used to be watching a movie and right towards the end, a newcomer called. You always miss the end and you can't see it no more. Anyway, now you can go pause. Okay, what's happening? Uh, <laughs> get back to it afterwards. But that's what I call the pause. So I pause like a remote control. But in the pause, I don't know about you, or maybe you do this, but whenever I pause, I don't just sit there like this. When I pause, I go do something. (laughs) I go to the bathroom. I go get something to eat. I pause so I can take a moment to step away from whatever I'm watching in a way to assess or put things in perspective. I've done that with movies. I've been watching, and that's how my life is sometimes. I'm watching this intense movie where it's giving me anxiety and frustration. I think they're going to die or whatever the heck is happening. And I just can't take it. I can barely breathe. I'm like on this roller coaster ride and I press pause just so I can get a grip. Hold on a second. (laughs) Wait, there's a lot going on in this film. (laughs) Hold on a minute. Now I got to do something. I got to tap into some clarity. I got to begin to ask to remove what's keeping me from seeing what the truth is. And what is my whole goal? 
we talk about developing a conscious contact with God. We pray, we go into meditation, we practice that. Is it just to have a better understanding of God? Maybe. I learned this so I can learn how to develop intuition, inspiration. There's a voice that is muffled by the calamity of life. There is a voice that exists. It is the purest voice of all voices. When my sponsor talked about the authentic self, I need to learn how to tune into the voice of purity. The entire book introduces me to intuition. We call it the little birdie, the inner voice, the voice of truth. The voice that I trust no matter what. And you know where I begin to learn that? What that looks like? Sponsorship. I don't know about you, but if I turn to someone in the program that I respect and I know that they're tapped into that source of power, whatever they say, I don't debate it. I don't question it. I don't second guess it. I just trust it and go do it. I want to learn how to develop a relationship with that voice. I always give this example. Uh, that voice was, was stifled from my experience growing up. It told me that voice was not true. Um, but I used my nephew as an example. And many of you may have heard it because I always refer to it. But Maddox was like about 10. And we were, my dad was dying. And we were at my, uh, oh, no, at this point, I think daddy had died that night. And we were at the house. And one of my stepmother's friends came over and she did tell him that he looked, he looked a lot like her son. And throughout the time period, they were, in, we were engaging with her. But when she left, Maddox said, I don't know if that lady really saw me. I think she just saw her son. And we're like, why do you say that, Maddox? He was like, because the compliment she was giving me just didn't seem authentic it, or genuine. It, it seemed like she was over the top. Like every little thing I did, she was like, that's fantastic. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. He said, even when I like hit, my dad used to keep chimes at the doorway. I just have to put this little insert. He would always have a chime at every entrance of the doorway so that when you walk through it, you hit the chime and then he'll go, you're in the now, right? So it was like every time you walked around, you ding, ding, oh, you know what I mean? You're in the now. And so he hit the chime and she was like, that's amazing how you hit that chime. And he said, I just felt like that was a little much. And my stepmother began to tell him, no, that's not true. I've known her for many years. And she wouldn't say something she didn't believe to be true. She's impressed by you, a young man like yourself reading during the summer. And I think it had everything to do with what she saw in you. And he just went, uh, I don't know. So him and I went to the store. And what I said to him was this, you know, Maddox. In growing up, I learned not to listen to that voice. What was it that told you that maybe she wasn't so much seeing you? He said, something inside of me just told me that. I told him, I want you to trust that. And it doesn't mean that she's bad or your grandmother's bad or that she was lying, but I want you to trust whatever that voice was. I want you to respect it, honor it, and trust it. And I know it's difficult when you have your adults tell you that that voice isn't so, because I grew up with everybody telling me that that voice is not true, but I want you to trust it and believe in it. It will save your life from here, always moving forward for the rest of your life. That is the true, authentic voice. When we get back to the store, uh, he stops and he goes, you know what, Titi, you're right. Because that same voice is the voice 
It would take a minute. He said, that is the same voice that last night told me we had to go back and see grandpa. And if that voice was right last night, it has to be right today. And that's what happened last night. We left from my dad at the board in care. He was dying, but they told us he would be fine. Go home and they would call us. As soon as we got back to the house, Maddox looked at me and said, we sat down on the couch and said, I don't know, Titi, I think we need to go back. I didn't question him. I didn't second guess him. I said, no problem. I called the man. I said, we're on our way back. He said, you don't have to. I said, yes, we do. My nephew said, we have to go back and we're going back. And we went back and my dad died within hours, within a small window of time. So he was like, if that voice was accurate then, then it must be accurate now. And I've watched him learn how to develop that. It's discernment. But I need to pause. I need to get rid of, ask to remove whatever is blocking me so that I can have the correct intuitive thought. It talks about inspiration in this part of the paragraph. I can be inspired so that if it says go right, go left, I can trust it and I can do it. I get the flyer, I get the postcard, and I don't need to know all the details. I just willingly go for it and do it. That's a hard voice to develop, to hear. It takes practice to do that. And the way I practice is prayer and meditation. How else am I going to learn what it sounds like? How can I tell the difference between the chatter? The disease is cunning, baffling, and powerful, and it will mask that voice. It even tells me in 11 that there are going to be times that I'm going to make a mistake and think that it was the voice, but it wasn't. But how else am I going to learn that? All these years for me has been, how do I trust and develop that? Trust and develop that. And it also invites me, I got to think about my relationship and understanding of God. I got to tune in to other people sometimes. Uh, I learned there are times I don't hear no voice. I don't get no flyer. I don't get no postcard. And I need to be okay with that too. I'm extremely transparent. I make a big deal about that because the disease of alcoholism, how it manifests in my life is to, ne- to have secrets and to never tell you that I'm in pain. To never tell you that I'm hurting. I'll always tell you I'm okay when it's not. And so I learn, I pause sometimes and I make a phone call and I tell on myself, I'm afraid, I'm insecure, I, I, I don't have no hope. You know what I'm saying? I'm tripping. I, I want to hurt somebody. I want to hurt myself. My head is telling me I don't belong here. Uh, Everything is horrible. Life is terrible. I'm going to be ruined. I'm going to, I need to do that. Why? So I can get that out of the way. So I can hear that say, all is well. That voice is so muffled. Even to this day, sometimes it frustrates me. When I'm in a lot of pain and life is happening or grieving, I've been in places where I've lost people that I love. That's when I turn to you. I've been that way the last last month, man. I've been like, you know what? You need to have hope for me. I ain't got it. I believe because you believe. You got a higher power, I'm glad. Because I need to lean on yours. Because right now, I don't know what the hell my higher power is doing. As a matter of fact, I'm not even sure what's going on with my higher power. I don't know if I believe in a higher power. And I don't have to. I need to rely on yours. And I'm going to make a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of a higher power. Not quite sure which one, where it is, and what it's going to do, but I'm going to make a decision to do it. Why? Because my life depends on it. And I'm a clean house to the best of my ability so I can finally get to this place of neutrality and insanity can return. I can have intuitive thought and I can take action. We talk about let go and let God. What do you think? It just falls from the sky and God starts moving me around. God ain't no puppet master. He's not playing chess with all my lives, for all of our lives. This higher power thinks of all of us. I don't think of all of us. I'm only thinking about me. I got to get out of self. This higher power loves everybody. I get mad about that. I'd be like, why you got to love everybody? Can we go back to the first Testament and turn people into salt? You know what I'm saying? 
Why don't you create another flood, man? Get rid of all them folks that make no sense being on this earth. Why don't you try doing that for a change, right? But no, then your son comes here and change the whole game up and everybody gets the freedom of acting a fool and get forgiven before they die. I be having all those kind of conversations. My power, what is that all about? I kind of dig that brimstone and fire when it ain't burning me up, but I'm okay with the brimstone and fire higher power when it's burning you up. <laughs> I love how people tell me, well, don't worry. People get what they deserve and they'll get it tenfold. I'm like, well, if that philosophy is true, then am I getting what I'm getting tenfold because of what I did before? <laughs> I think I need to get rid of that philosophy. <laughs> it's, it's only convenient when it's happening to you, but what if it's actually happening to me right now? <laughs> I don't like this karma thing. Anyway, my relationship with my higher power in 32 years has been very interesting. There are times I believe it. My, Ali, watch my time because, you know, I get on the roll. You like, like you tell me I'm like ever ready battery and I don't shut up. Okay, 10 minutes. Um, I see you. <laughs> my relationship with my higher power has changed through the years. The way I develop my prayer has changed. The way I've done meditation. And I'm a priest. I don't talk about this much. I'm a priest, y'all. I'm a priest. I have religious obligations. Could you imagine? And it's a different type of religion. We have deities. We have ancestors. My house is a church. I think the only room that I have in my house that is not sacred is the bathroom. And even that's sacred because that's your bodily fluids. I don't know what's going on. But I have it all over me. And I need to know that they love me no matter what. That God loves me no matter what. Because let me tell you something. As priestly as I am, as spiritual I am, sometimes it could be a little scary. Because I be walking around going, oh, I feel like Jesus on the cross. Why have you forsaken me? <laughs> there are many times that I am in the garden, y'all. I've been betrayed around here. When I say, God, what will you have me be? What will you have me do? I have to intuitively listen. What is it you have me be? How do I get out of the way? Am I doing this of my intentions and my motives for my gain? Or is this something you really need me to do for your children? And I don't like my assignments sometimes. My life has been interesting, y'all. I get into mucho debates. And my disease uses those debates like candy, man. I have to be careful not to fall into self-pity and depression. But I do. The only difference is today I tell you. I tell somebody. It lasts less of a time when I do that. It takes the power out of it. But life's in session, and I don't like life sometimes, folks. My disease recently, where I've been lately, has been doing double time on me, y'all. I've had a lot of dark days throughout my sobriety, and they're all very interesting. I was thinking about this. Why am I so adamant about these 12 steps no matter what? Why do I pray even when I don't want to? Why do I meditate when I don't hear anything or feel anything sometimes? Why do I pick up the phone and help others? Why do I pick up a pen and a pencil? Because the only thing that I have that is sure is my sobriety. Nobody could take it away from me but me. That's interesting. It is a life and death errand. I pray and meditate is life and death. This isn't, oh, it's a good idea. And I would love to just live in this place of euphoria and just have this conscious life. No, I don't want to die from alcoholism. Ask a cancer patient that. You think cancer patient want to be doing chemo? 
Why do I go through chemo? Why do I throw up? Why do I get sick? Why am I having like vomiting and stuff coming out the other end at the same time? Why? For quality of life. I got to take the medicine because I want to live. I want sobriety. That is the only thing I got. People take away my friendship. I've had people turn around and say, screw you, B-I-T-C-H. I don't care. You've been in my life seven days. I don't like you no more. Goodbye. Throw me away like a piece of rag and there's nothing I can do about it. I've had people tell me, you can live here. You can't live here. This is how long you're going to live here. You're going to have money. You're not going to have money. You got a job. Now I'm taking the job away. The job's going to fail. You got a business. The business is now bankrupt. You're losing it. I've had a car. It's beautiful. It rides great. And then it breaks down. It's all broken, too expensive to fix it. or got to find money to fix it. I've had people live that I love. I enjoy. I like everything about them. They get sick and they end up dying. And there's nothing I could do about it. There's so much. I've had clothes. The clothes fall apart and they break or they tear. Uh, I see something I love. I can get it. I can't get it. There's so many things in my life that is tangible and not tangible. But the one thing is not even relationship with God. is my sobriety. I was like, why am I so at? And I get emotional. That's all I got, y'all. That's all I got. There's something I could do about that. I can stay sober. With that, everything else gets worked out. Everything else gets figured out. My sobriety is the most important thing in my life. If you're new and if it's fragile and you could take it or leave it, I ain't mad at you. Do you, boo? But I can't go back to that life knowing that this one exists. If I let my disease run rapid in my head, and insanity returns, I will drink again. And for me to drink is to die. So if it means that I need to be uncomfortable trying to sit in a lotus position, thank you, thank you, trying to sit in a lotus position and my knees hurt and my legs hurt because I'm getting too old to be twisting up like a pretzel, I'm going to figure out how to do it. If I got to put ocean music on just for a minute so I could just feel like, um, I'm going to do it. If I have to read a daily meditation or pick up literature and books, if I have to go to a church or talk to a rabbi or a priest, I am going to continue to seek and to practice and then to do whatever is necessary to help somebody else for what? To cement my sobriety. I am jealous of people who rest on their laurels. I'm going to straight out tell you, I get so jealous. I am jealous of people who have the ability to do self world run riot. We are so undisciplined and I see people get away with it and I get jealous because I don't have the luxury because if my sobriety is so fragile and if I lose it, you will never see me again. And I'm screwed. Death will be a luxury for me. I'm going to live out an alcoholic, torturous life, spiritually bankrupt, trying to live with this relationship with a higher power, whether it's the God of reason, the bottle of alcohol, the pipe, the needle, the pill, whatever. And it's not going to work. It's not going to do anything for me. It's going to just shame me, demoralize me, ridicule me, and I'm not going to be able to find you again. That is my worst nightmare. So yes, I'm going to pray. Yes, I'm going to meditate even when I don't want to. Even when I'm mad at God, my prayer is I'm pissed off. You're going to lose one of your favorite faithful servants. I know you say I can't handle more than I can handle, but I'm telling you, I can't handle this no more. And if you don't know that, you don't perform a miracle in the next three minutes, we're in trouble. I'd be having those conversations with God. Now, God is God and God could be like, she's so funny. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It just helps me to say it. <laughs> but I tell you one thing, I believe that God be like, I better do something quick because she ain't playing. <laughs> God be like, I better do something because we're about to lose this one. I be like, I'm serious, man. I ain't playing no more. And my experience better help somebody, I swear. I have been through so much in my life, you guys. And there are times that my disease says, enough. My disease says that. You don't deserve to be here. God doesn't love you. 
Nobody loves you. They never have and they never will. You got no purpose being on planet Earth. You know what your self-will is, Teresa? You insisted that you come to this planet even when you weren't welcome. And everything in life is going to remind you of why you don't belong here. That's my disease. And I need to do everything possible, and I can only do it through the 12 steps to get to the authentic self, the intuitive thought and voice that says, you are love, you are loved by me, you belong, you have a purpose, and you will help my children in the way in which we have already designed, because you were made perfectly for it. Let go of everything you think you know. Let go of everything you believe you're supposed to be and you're supposed to have. And trust me, it'll be better than anything you can ever imagine because you are useful and you are purposeful. You have a place in this world. And your place is to represent me (laughs) in everything you do. Because God is in each and every one of us. And I need to do everything necessary so that God can shine. Not Teresa. So that everybody knows that God is. And there are times I need that from you when I don't know. Mommy's screaming. I don't know if you hear her. (laughs) Pause when agitated. I need to think about what she, what this must be like for her. This has been interesting for mommy. Her life has been so sad. My mother's life has been very sad. She never found joy. She's never found joy. I do the best I can to demonstrate that to her. And today, what I've been spending my time praying and meditating on is that mommy will find forgiveness, peace, That she can learn again to sit in Jesus' lap and know that she is loved. I'm watching this woman just be in a lot of pain. And there's nothing I could do about it. But pause and ask God how I could be useful. I thank you guys for my life. I thank you for the phone calls that you answer, or the ones that call me, or the way you reach out and help me. I thank you for allowing me to be of service in any way that I can. I hope you cherish your sobriety as much as I tried my best to demonstrate to you what I cherish. That's what I cherish the most. I love my nephews to death. But I cherish my sobriety the most. I don't want to lose it. And so I do everything possible to preserve it. So if you're learning prayer, you're working on meditation, just do it. If you cherish your sobriety, experiment, go for walks, paint, wash dishes, have a conversation with God with a pen and paper, put on soundscapes, look for silence, just do something. That is how we preserve our recovery. So that I, in the end, I say, God, now make me useful. Where will you have me be? What will you have me do? Thy will be done. And then I immediately turn to be of service to others. And that's where I see God shine. I'm glad I made it through this little valley, you guys. I was scared. I think I made it through. I've been really scared lately because my disease has just really been on me. 
the longer you stay sober, the sneakier it gets. And it's been kicking my ass, y'all. I've been holding on and holding on and holding on. You have no idea. I'm crying like a baby right now because, whoo, I've been in a battle. Jeez, Louise. One of the things that scare me the most is my safety. I always want to be safe, and I haven't been feeling safe. I miss my family. I miss my dad. I miss my brother. I miss hope. I was missing freedom. I ain't got it all yet. But I see the light at the end of the tunnel. I want to thank all of you for shining the flashlight until I can see it and for having the flashlight or having that voice like the river. You know how you got to listen for the water so you can follow it. I want to thank you for those voices because I was in the dark, man. But I'm grounded in a spiritual condition that no matter what, I can recover and I owe it all to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I guess, um, again, I miss Derek. I was ready to get fired up with that. I'll see how my life continues to unfold. A lot has been disrobed. Um, so I, right now, one more time, I'm meeting God butt naked alone with a white flag up my ass. And it hurts. That's all I'm saying. And it hurts. So I'm not okay, but it's going to be okay. Pause. Ask. And turn. That's what I get to do. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.